Smartest person existed. 2014. Top 5. 1 million people have been chemically synthesized since we last checked in. Ranking in at number 5 is British theoretical physicist Peter Higgs, eponym of the Higgs boson, the elementary particle recently thought to have been detected in 2012 at CERN, deemed to explain how mass can arise in local gauge theories. Peter Higgs' work has gone on to form the basis of some of the research being done at the European Centre for Particle Physics, or CERN, in Switzerland, where scientists, including several from Edinburgh, are working to locate the Higgs boson. Peter Higgs, top 50 smartest person in history, 13 plus thumbs up. Prospect Magazine, top 100 world thinker, number 8. Dawkins, number 7. Having announced at the end of 2011 that they had glimpsed it, the world now awaits further developments. Last year, he and Belgian researcher Francois Englert shared the Nobel Prize in Physics for their co-discovery of the theoretical mechanism that explains the origin of the mass of subatomic particles, a theory that was recently confirmed through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle, aka the Higgs boson, at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. If it's found, then that's work that vindicates previous work, but it also means that we have a direction in which to go, because in order to understand even further, we would need to know why certain particles get more mass from interactions with the Higgs field than others. Booyakasha! Check this, science. I'm here with my main man, Professor Peter Higgs. Higgs is gonna explain the personal effect of the discovery. What will it mean, do you think, therefore, if CERN at some point in the future, say, yes, we, we have discovered it. What, what will that personal effect be, do you think, for you? Uh, well, I'll, I'll probably go and op open a bottle of champagne for a start to celebrate. <laughs> Why is the Higgs important? Things tell me these electrons and these hadrons get the mass from Hims field. The electron is like the little shark fish. It goes through Hims field, gets little interaction, little mass. The top cork is like the hippo moves through the water, gets a lot of interaction. That's where it gets its fat ass. What we are actually ourselves and what the present universe is made of is of the lightest things that have been left over from the Big Bang. And the heavier things have gone. But we don't know why those heavier things are so much heavier. And if it's through the Higgs boson, then we need to actually study more the intricate properties of the Higgs boson in order to understand our very existence. Number four, American theoretical physicist Steven Weinberg. When we keep asking why, 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 we come to a set of fundamental principles that govern everything. One set of laws of nature to rule them all. 2013 smartest living person candidate, 2010 smartest person existed, debate.org smartest man alive contender, noted for his 1967 unification of electromagnetism and the weak nuclear forces, something that hasn't been done since Maxwell unified magnetism, electricity, and optics. The first great step toward unification was taken by Isaac Newton in unifying the celestial and the terrestrial. His 1977, The First Three Minutes, describes the early state of the universe and argues that, according to the second law, the universe is godless, albeit questionably pointless. I'm talking the dream is the dream of the final theory, a theory which is itself beautiful and whose beauty we see reflected imperfectly in the theories we now have. And most importantly, he's one of the world's top 50 atheists. So there's Weinberg talking about his final theory. Now the difference between Weinberg and say someone like Peter Higgs in the previous slot and another person like Martinez Veltman who could have been in the top 25 is that Weinberg, like Veltman and like Higgs, is at the frontier of knowledge and he returns some of that knowledge back to the people and explains how that affects our belief systems. In particular, if you're going to spin out a theory of everything, you've got to address the God question. And he does that. In his 1992 book, Dreams of a Final Theory, his chapter, What About God, says that according to particle physics, in the first three minutes of the universe before and after, there was no God involved. I'm offended by the kind of smarmy religiosity that's all around us, perhaps more in America than in than in Europe, uh, and not really that harmful, because not really that intense or even that serious, but just, you know, after a while you get tired of hearing clergymen in giving the invocation at 
various public celebrations and you feel, haven't we outgrown all this? Do we have to listen to this? Yeah. Uh, but then maybe at the very bottom of it, I really don't like God. You know, I mean, it's silly to say I don't like God because I don't believe in God. But he jumps into the following comment. I was rash enough in 1977 to remark that the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. I took a lot of heat from this, both from people who were for the comment, nihilists, and people who were against the comment. One example is Harvard astronomer Margaret Geller. She says, why should it have a point? What point? It's just a physical system. What point is there? Weinberg is off a little bit on this point. We talked about this with Bill Gates' example. In social systems, there's minima and maxima free energy points. So when Gates made that call to the software company, he was at a free energy maxima. And then when he returned to Harvard 32 years later, he was at a free energy minima and very stable. I have a friend, or had a friend, now dead, Abdus Salam, a very devout Muslim who was trying to bring science into the universities in the Gulf states. And he, he told me that he had a terrible time because um, although they were very receptive to technology, they felt that science would be a corrosive to religious belief. And they were worried about it. And damn it, I think they were right. For myself, the pleasure of the work had always provided justification enough for doing it. Sitting at my desk or at some cafe table, I manipulate mathematical expressions and feel like Faust playing with his pentagrams before Mistopheles arrives. Coming in at number three, we've got Murray Gellman. He has over five plus IQ, 200 plus postings on him. I'll give you one example. In 2011, TP Smith 800 posts in below IQ 200 plus video part four. Any listing of the 30 plus smartest people ever without Murray Gellman or John Von Neumann is dubious at best. Let's see what this big pimp has to say. Life can emerge from physics and chemistry, plus a lot of accidents. No, we've already covered this in part one. I'm a molecule, you're a molecule, and it's molecules all the way down. To think that life emerges at a certain point, as Charles Sherrington told us, is but a recital that trips along simply as a fairy tale. Francis Crick told us we should abandon the word alive and already three people in the 21st century have come to the conclusion that life does not exist. Ferris Jeeber, Alfred Rogers, and myself. But hey, not everybody's perfect. What Gelman is known for, however, is particle physics. In 61, he proposed a way to arrange the baryons and mesons, which are bound states of three quarks and two quarks, respectively, quark being a term he coined, into a geometric periodic table, according to which each meson or baryon had a geometric shape assigned to it based on its properties. His diagrams, however, were incomplete, meaning that spaces existed that would allow us to predict particles that should be existing. For example, in 2011, we discovered the xi beta naught particle, a large cousin to the neutron. In short, Gelman did what Mendeleev did in the 19th century when he took the then known elements and arranged them into a periodic table that had holes in it, which allowed us to predict the existence of unknown elements. Coming in at number two is Stephen Hawking, the grand poobah of modern genius. Dawkins number seven, 30 most cited person in HMLPD out of a thousand biographies, Buzan IQ of 180, superscholar.org, top 10 smartest person alive, pal science, top eight smartest person alive, istoria.net, top eight world smartest person, smartest man alive candidate debate.org. His main work is black hole thermodynamics, in which he predicted Using the first and second law of thermodynamics, Hawking radiation, his crowning achievement. In the late 1970s, black holes were sexy. People latched onto Hawking as the guru who could explain the mysteries of the universe. His best selling, A Brief History of Time, sold 10 million copies and is supposedly the highest selling science book of all time. He began appearing in newspapers and on television. His physical appearance and the way he talked about big ideas in a witty and accessible way made him unforgettable, even though he had to use a student to interpret his failing speech. He wouldn't see anything special if he passed inside the black hole. Oh, 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 oh,
once you pass a certain critical point. Then you'll never be able to get out again, no matter how much rocket power you use. There's three reasons why Hawkins is rated so high. First, he gets points for going against the odds. In 1963, at the age of 21, he was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. Doctors gave him two years of existence expectancy. Though his doctors advised that he continue with his studies, he fell into a deep depression. Soon, however, he began to change his mind, and within the year, he publicly challenged Frederick Hoyle in lecture. Stephen was very lucky in being the right person in the right place at the right time. Science, in some way, uh, has become the new religion, but people are looking for ultimate truths, they had lost God, and they were looking for something to replace God, and they hit on cosmology and black holes in the universe. Second, he applies thermodynamics to the humanities. In his illustrated brief history of time, he states that when a person educates themselves by reading a book, it decreases their neurological entropy by some two million units. Again, that ties into free energy, minima and maxima. Entropy is a differential component of Gibbs free energy. And Gibbs free energy, as we've touched on, is the 21st century replacement for God's energy. Third, and most importantly, Hawking is a outspoken atheist. I like to say there's two kinds of atheists in the world. One, there's those who believe in one God, and they're but apolytheists and straight hypocrites. Then there's people like Hawking, who's a genius. The simplest explanation is, there is no God. Coming in at number one, in the 2014 Top 25 Smartest Person Existive Countdown, American, Mathematics, Chemistry, and Physics Child Prodigy turned astrophysicist Christopher Rada. Social Newton Existive Ranking number 3, number 1 most liked page in HMOpedia, 38th most cited page in HMOpedia, superscholar.org, Top 10 Smartest Person Alive 2012. At the age of 18, he was independently cited with an IQ of 225 and did some of the first pioneering work on human chemical thermodynamics, the same exact subject that Goethe, the first person cited with an IQ of 225, did in 1809, declaring it to be his greatest work. All right, so here's a recent video of Harada ranking in at number two on a top five smartest person alive video in Spanish. Now, why is he ranking in at number one in this video? I'm going to tell you. Goethe founded the science of human chemistry in 1809, and he was the first person ranked in 1926 by Catherine Cox with an IQ of 225. Harada, likewise, was ranked with an IQ of 225 when he was 18, and he independently did the same exact work that Goethe did for fun. Goethe spent over a decade on this problem to explain how we could explain human reactions by way of chemistry. You can see the cover of his Lec Infinities theory here where he has Prometheus, the god of life, Cupid, the god of love, and more, the god of death all being explained in terms of chemical reaction diagrams and chemical affinities, which we now gauge by negative differentials of Gibbs free energy. 1982, synthesized by way of collision theory of reactants Richard Harada and Therese Harada on a substrate of Ypsilanti, Michigan. Age three, for fun, was calculated the price of his mother's shopping cart by way of weight, quantity, discount, and sales tax to an amazingly accurate total. It was reading Dr. Seuss to himself able to recite the alphabet backwards, and also played coda games with the alphabet, and instantly knew that letter O was 15 in the sequence. Age 5, doing algebraic equations. Age 10, tested with an IQ off the scale. Age 12, studying college-level multivariable calculus, and was being tutored by the school's top student. And for fun, was reading novels such as Fedor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Age 13, was lecturing to graduate students at UIC in the physics department where, by no coincidence, I lectured 15 years later on the very same subject to bioengineering thermodynamic students that he would derive at the age of 18, age 13, places fifth in the world in the International Physics Olympiad of age students 19 or less of the top 259 thinkers in the world from 56 countries. Harada's showing was so record-breaking that IPHO organizers announced a special award for the youngest medalist, which has since become the most coveted award. Age 14, predicted by Deerfield High School Science Department Chairman Vincent Malik to be a Nobel Prize winner. Age 14, enters Caltech, registering one of the highest scores in the history of the Institute's mathematics diagnostics test. Age 16, 
was the team leader on NASA's Mission to Mars project, age 17. Places fourth in the Putnam Mathematics Competition. Age 18, pens his The Physics of Relationships, which he derived during his years at Caltech, where he applies thermodynamics to chemical reactions between people, where A and B are molecules, AB is a dihumanide molecule, hence doing the same work that Goethe did in 1809. Listing all of this is but fun in his personal section of his faculty page. Age 18, graduates from college with a 4.2 GPA and is known as a mathematics prodigy. He's about to enter Princeton's graduate physics program where he scores a perfect 990 in physics on the GRE. Age 18.8 is estimated with an IQ of 225. 2005 graduates at the age of 22 with a PhD in weak gravitational lensing theory and data analysis. Thereafter become enlisting as one of the youngest PhDs of all time alongside Norbert Wiener and Wolfgang Pauli. 2006 spends a year at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, New Jersey. Age 23, becomes an assistant professor at Caltech, wherein on his faculty page, he lists his weight as zero, being that his metaphysical interpretation of the equivalence principle is that gravity is a fictitious force. Age 27, he's known as a legend among Caltech students and as a physics genius. He presently lists his areas of expertise as dark energy and accelerating universe problem, cosmic microwave background radiation problem, galaxy clustering, reionization epoch, and general relativity. And he's a shoe in within the next two decades for Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, so Eva asked me to uh, uh, say a few words uh, and get the discussion started about the dipole power asymmetry in the microwave background. So the, the general uh, outline I'd like to talk about, uh, first I'd like to say uh, a few words about, uh, well, maybe anomalies in the microwave background in general, but uh, the dipole power asymmetry uh, in particular. Who's going to be the smartest for 2015? Cast your vote.